All right, you can take your Bibles and you can turn to John chapter 1, verses 35 through 51. John 1, 35 through 51. I know when I left that I was in the midst of a series entitled The Road out of Second Peter. I am not done with that. I just didn't feel like coming back and preaching my first sermon out of Second Peter because it was uh, uh, Second Peter chapter two because it was going to be on Satan. I didn't really want that to be my first sermon straight back from Israel. All right. Uh, in fact, the next two weeks are going to be on Satan and his work in the church and his work in the world uh, when we get back to the road. But today we're going to be in John chapter one thirty five through fifty one, and this is inspired by my trip a little bit. One of my most favorite moments was that moment on the boat on the Sea of Galilee. I mean, you could say all kinds of things about Israel, I mean, Jerusalem and all that. But that moment of being in that location, being able to look around at various locations, knowing that Jesus had been there, knowing that that was the location where he had called his disciples was along that northern side of the Sea of Galilee, just meant much to me, much for me about my own calling, uh, much to me about just his presence. Uh, Jerusalem was wonderful, but it was hustle and bustle. Sea of Galilee, like I said, there was hardly anybody anywhere we went, but when we were on the boat, there was hardly any other boats out on the water. I mean, we were just out there, and it was you know just quiet, and it was calm, and, and he would just say, look over there. Now, that's the hillside where they believe Jesus taught the Sermon on the Mount. And over there is a little church, and that's where they believe that he met with his disciples after his resurrection and asked Peter three times if he loved him. You know, and they could just point all these places out, and, and it was just amazing. And so today I want to look at, in the Gospel of John, where Jesus began calling his disciples. Um, these, many of them were, were fishermen, and one of the things I've come to learn, not just from Israel, but just realize was that in that region, that was the primary means of income. And so they may have actually been some of the wealthier people in their towns. Uh, evidence of that we found in Capernaum, where in Capernaum they found the synagogue that's in Capernaum. Capernaum was the town Jesus went to live in after Nazareth. And it was also the hometown of Peter's mother-in-law, whom Jesus healed and stayed at home. Guess where her home was? right next to the synagogue, indicating that she was probably fairly wealthy to be that close, to have a home right there. Um, so these were not just ordinary men, but at the same time, in comparison to those Jesus could have chosen, they were ordinary. Do you realize that Jesus did not choose one rabbi? Not one Pharisee, not one scribe. Not one Sadducee, some of them eventually followed him, but he never went to any of them and said, follow me. We never see that anywhere in Scripture. In fact, remember, Nicodemus came to Jesus. Jesus didn't go to Nicodemus. So Jesus chose people that nobody else would have chosen for the great work of the Messiah on earth. And so we get to some of those being chosen and selected. And we start with verse 35. It says this. Again, the next day, John, this is John the Baptist, was standing with two of his disciples, and he looked at Jesus as he walked and said, Behold, the Lamb of God. The two disciples heard him speak, and they followed Jesus. And Jesus turned and saw them following and said to them, What do you seek? They said to him, Rabbi, which translated means teacher, where are you staying? He said to them, Come and you will see. So they came and saw where he was staying, and they stayed with him that day, for it was about the tenth hour. One of the two who heard John speak and followed him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found his, first his own brother Simon and said to him, We have found the Messiah, which translated means Christ. He brought him to Jesus. Jesus looked at him and said, You are Simon, the son of John. You shall be called Cephas, which is translated Peter. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee, and he found Philip and Jesus said to him, Follow me. Now Philip was from Bethsaida of the city of Andrew and Peter. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Nathanael said to him, Can any good thing come out of Nazareth? Philip said to him, Come and see. 
Jesus saw Nathanael coming to him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Nathanael said to him, How do you know me? Jesus answered and said to him, Before Philip called you when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Nathanael answered him, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. Jesus answered and said to him, Because I said to you that I saw you under the fig tree, do you believe? You will see greater things than these. And he said to him, Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. All right, going back to 35 and through 36, we see that John the Baptist is, is teaching, he's preaching. Uh, we're told back up in verse 28 that he was baptizing near Bethany beyond the Jordan. Now, Bethany beyond the Jordan is not like the Bethany where Mary, Martha, and Lazarus were from. That's right outside Jerusalem. This is Bethany to the east of the Jordan, and it's unknown with any, it's not known with any certainty where that town was. There are some maps that place it on the southern end of the Jordan River and some that place it on the northern end because you've got the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River coming down, connecting to the Dead Sea. It's all one connection. And Bethany beyond the Jordan could either be north or it could be south. John the Baptist baptized at both locations. Uh, both in the southern part, the Dead Sea, that's where Natalie and I were baptized, and at the northern part of the Jordan, just below the Sea of Galilee. Jesus, we're told in the Scriptures, was baptized in Judea, which means he was baptized in the southern part of the Jordan River, just above the Dead Sea, where we were. Meaning that likely, likely Bethany beyond the Jordan is to the south. More than likely which is where most place it. Um, we're told that John the Baptist baptized there coming out of the Judean wilderness. Uh, that's wilderness. That's rock. That is mountainous rock. That's all it is. It's not sand like a desert. They call it the desert, but it's not. It's the Judean wilderness. There's nothing out there. You drive out there like we did, and there's salt flats all around the the, the Dead Sea, and to, to one side, and then on the other side, it's just monstrous rock all over the place. And part of that is Qumran, where the Dead Sea Scrolls are found. And they think that John the Baptist, many believe that John the Baptist stayed with the Essenes there, and that that's where he was out in the wilderness, studying the Word of God, being engrossed in it, immersed in it, until he came out and began to preach and teach and baptize. So Jesus is likely down south, which is very interesting because we have these men who are from Bethsaida, which is northeast of the Sea of Galilee, which tells me that they have been introduced to the teaching of John the Baptist. And since it says they're disciples, they're following him. They're going where he goes. They're way away from home. They're a couple of days journey, at least a few days journey from home. And spending that time with John the Baptist. And John says something in verse 36 that he says earlier in this very same chapter. So this is the second time he says it. He sees Jesus walking along because Jesus, after being baptized, is hanging out. He's staying somewhere in that area. He's hanging out. And John says, behold the Lamb of God. This is extremely significant. Extremely significant. John just identified Jesus based on Isaiah 53. Isaiah 53 is the prophecy of the suffering servant. He did not identify the Messiah as a great warrior who was going to come and rescue them from Rome. He identified him as a sacrifice on an altar. You see that? So we now know what John the Baptist was preaching. He was preaching to Andrew. And to John, who's the other disciple here, how do I know that? Because he leaves him unnamed. John never names himself in his own gospel. Andrew and John are two disciples of John the Baptist sitting under his teaching as he says, Behold the Lamb of God, because he's been teaching about the Lamb of God. He's been teaching the Messiah was going to come and be sacrificed for their sin. He's saying, wait a minute, Chris, if these guys are all the way down here, and they're called at the southern end. What about the times when these disciples were all up around the Sea of Galilee and Jesus came along and said, follow me, and they dropped their nets and followed him? 
There are multiple callings of these same men. By that I mean some of them were following John the Baptist, Andrew, John, Simon. They were following Philip. They were following John the Baptist. Jesus begins to collect them. They begin to get associated with him, and then they go home. And when Jesus is ready to strike out into the fullness of his ministry, he goes along and he picks them back up again. So when he says, follow me, and they drop their nets, they already know who he is. They've already spent time with him. It's not they're going, okay, I don't know who you are, but sure, I'll just follow you. They were dumb. They knew who they were following. John the Baptist had identified who he was for them. And after spending time with him, they saw no reason to doubt it. It's with all that in mind that it seems the men Jesus called, as I said, as disciples had heard John teach all of this. And John's identification was all they needed. When he said, Behold the Lamb of God, they said, Messiah, Christ, that's him. And this is when we get to the choices of fellowship. The choices of fellowship. That is a real word, by the way. I had to look it up this morning. I thought I was making up a word. I thought I'd done something awesome. But it's a real word. It means exactly what I intended to mean. Submitting yourself to following the leadership of another. We can have fellowship with Jesus, but I want to tell you, it's only if we have developed the fellowship of Jesus. Fellowship. What are these choices of fellowship that I want to talk about today? Well, Jesus gives us the first one, and it's know what you're after. Know what you're after. He looks at them as they start to follow him, and he says in verse 38, What do you seek? What are you after? And notice their response. Rabbi, meaning they want to learn something. Sure, where are you staying? Where are you staying? All they were seeking was just to be with him. If he's the Messiah, I need to be where you are. They don't ask for healing. They don't ask for wisdom, knowledge, riches. They aren't seeking what the prosperity gospel will give them. They're not seeking what a faith healer could give them. They aren't seeking what the social gospel will give them. None of that matters. They just want to be where he is. They called him teacher, so they clearly wanted to learn, but they chose to seek him and his presence. I believe I've said it to her at this point, but I've heard it said that when it comes to a daughter like I have, uh, one of the greatest pieces of advice to give her is that what she uses to attract a man is what that man will be attracted to. You understand what I'm saying? And it's likely all he'll see in her. That's why we have a problem with all these girls running around not wearing anything half the time. They're attracting men and eventually beauty fades. You know, things change. What does he think then? If all he was looking at was what she looked like and some, suddenly she doesn't look like that anymore, where is he going to be and what's he going to do? That's why my advice is always, and my advice to one lady, and I'm proud of her because she's actually had an opportunity to do this at one time, is any guy that she talks with, whether he's showing interest or not, one of the first things she lets him know is she's a Christian who goes to church and loves Jesus. Because when she finds the right man, it'll be the man that appreciates her for that one thing alone and nothing else will really matter. The same can be said of the church. What is used to attract people, and churches do try to attract people, can become what they attach themselves to. And if it's not Jesus, they'll miss him. They'll attach themselves to the church. They'll attach themselves to this aspect of the church or that aspect of the church. But if it's not Jesus, they'll miss Jesus. And they'll miss heaven as a result. If you talk about a church and what you admire about it is anything other than the presence of Jesus you experience there, then that church is doing something wrong. Not trying to be condemnatory, I'm just saying the facts. Church ought to be about one thing. Ought to be known for one thing Jesus. That's it. 
fellowship, preaching, music, it can all be on the list, but all of that comes after meeting with Jesus. All of that has to be another way we become attached more to Jesus. I mean, if a person's excited about the music, the preacher, I hope you're not too excited, I'm glad to be back, but, or the programs, but not Jesus, then the gospel mission is clouded at best. You know, lots of people in the scriptures had physical needs. They had spiritual needs, all kinds of needs, right? I mean, Jesus performed one miracle after another to meet needs. Those people probably had other people offer them advice, try to help them. That's what churches do. And that's a, that's a legitimate way of reaching people is to meet their physical needs and show them the love of Christ so that they'll come accept Christ. It's a truth, but it's not the only way people come to Jesus. Andrew didn't have to see the love of Jesus to follow him. He heard the word preached about him by a faithful man who pointed him out in the crowd. Andrew simply decided that Jesus was the one he should follow him. Jesus did nothing for him. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the praise man? No. Hearing by the preacher? No. Hearing by the word of God. And if the preacher's not preaching the word of God, then the people in that church are doomed as well. Other people followed Jesus after he healed them or did something for them, and that's legitimate. But it's also legitimate to just give them Jesus. Just talk about Jesus. That's what John did. John gave these men Jesus. Jesus offered them his continual presence, and they quickly began to spread the news. Did you pick up on that as we were reading through it? How one went to the other. They started going. You could tell as I was reading. It just sounded like they were getting more and more and more excited. I got to go tell this one. I got to go tell this one. I got to go find my brother. I got to go do this. I got to go tell these people. We found him. They got excited. You see, what we seek is what we get. Do you come here to meet with Jesus? I hope so. But be careful how you answer that so you're honest. Because sometimes I think we come just to meet with each other. Just being honest with you. We should be here to meet with Jesus, leave and follow Jesus, and be disciples of Jesus. If we're going to be where we belong in His kingdom, we have to make sure we're chasing after more of Him. We get to know, we get to Him because we seek Him and He lets us find Him. Jesus tells these two, what did He say? Come and you will see where I'm at. Do you get up each morning going, where are you today, Lord? I know you're right here. I just want to find you. I'm seeking you. Let me know where you are because I want to be where you are all day. I want to be in you all day and you and me. That's what Jesus talks about in John 15. Abide in me and I in you and you'll bear much fruit. Seek Him in His Word daily. Seek Him in prayer daily. Seek Him and you will see and understand and experience Him as He wants you to. It's a matter of just taking the time to daily seek Him and find that He's all you need and more than you ever realized. These disciples would get to see where He was staying and see much greater things than that because they were with Him. So if you feel like you're lacking the presence of Jesus in any way, ask yourself what you're seeking with your life. What is it that you're seeking that's getting in your way of finding more of Him? Make sure it's not God's approval you're seeking because you'll never measure up to that on your own. Don't make sure, don't make, think it needs to be my approval because my approval doesn't matter one bit. Doesn't have to be good fellowship, doesn't have to be love. Make sure it's Jesus and He'll add all these things unto you. Now look at verses 40 and 41. After these guys came and had to make sure what they were seeking, Andrew gets excited. One of the two who heard John speak and follow him was Andrew, Simon Peter's brother. He found first his own brother, of course. You go to family first and said to him, we have found the Messiah. Well, now Peter had, Simon had to know what that meant. He was around too. I think all three of these guys, Andrew, John, and Simon, were followers of John the Baptist. And they were all hanging out together, but Simon had gone off somewhere else, and so Andrew had to go find him. And that's when we get to the second choice of fellowship. And it's the choice to be ready to change. To be ready to change. 
And I'm not going to reread these verses, but you, you, you'll remember them, and, 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 and I'll summarize them as I go along. First of all, Jesus changed Simon's name in this moment and made it Peter. But Peter's life after that was in constant flux until he received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, and then he was never the same. Listen, a disciple is a person who lays aside who they are in order to become someone new. We have this mindset in our culture of Christianity here in our nation that we can walk an aisle, get baptized, and be the same person we were just with Jesus added in. That's not a disciple. Peter was changed. Simon was changed, I should say. The old things passed away. New things have come. Simon was a sinful fisherman. Peter was going to be a rock upon which Christ would build his church. Big difference. Big change. Big. Jesus changed Philip from being a seeker into a follower. I'll prove that here in just a moment. But let me talk about some other things as we go along. Whatever Philip was or did before he had, had to take a back seat to what Jesus wanted him to do now. And the change becomes immediately evident because Philip starts spreading the news. He goes and gets Nathaniel. Philip liked the idea of following Jesus so much that he went and found his friend, whose name could also be Bartholomew. If you look at the disciple list, Nathaniel and Bartholomew are the same person. And he brought him to Jesus. That's a change that Jesus wants to bring to all of those who follow him. Followership leads to evangelism. Followers want to produce more followers. If a Christian is not wanting to bring others to Jesus, then they're no longer following Jesus. They might go to church. They might pray. Might even read their Bible once in a while. But we're not following Jesus if we're not taking people or at least trying to lead people to Jesus. Because that's what he'd be doing. He was constantly drawing people to himself and training his disciples to bring them to him. When Jesus gets hold of a person's heart, that heart is filled with his love and that love flows outward to others so they might be brought into relationship with Jesus as well. If that flow is not happening, either we don't know him or we've damned up the flow to keep Jesus all to ourselves. So Jesus changed Peter's name. He changed Philip's mission. Now he's going to change Nathaniel's heart. The outlook of his heart. Look at verse 45. Philip found Nathanael. Let me back up. Let's back up to verse 43. The next day he purposed to go into Galilee. So Philip is not down there with the other ones. Philip is up at Galilee. Nathanael's up at Galilee, likely at Bethsaida. It says the next day he purposed to go. It doesn't say the next day he arrived, because that would be impossible, not for the Lord, but if these others were with him, that would be impossible. They walked the journey. It was probably several days. So after he meets Andrew and he meets uh, Simon and he meets John, the next day he starts out to Galilee. A few days later they get there and he found Philip. And Jesus said to him, follow me. But then we get to verse 45. Philip found Nathanael and said to him, We have found him of whom Moses in the law and also the prophets wrote, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Philip thoroughly identifies Jesus here. Do you catch that? Which proves to me that Philip was a seeker, which is why he was following John the Baptist. He was actively looking for the Messiah. He knew the characteristics of the Messiah because he says two things that are of great importance here. Him of whom Moses in the law, which means he had to be familiar with that, and also the prophets wrote. Philip's an educated man. Philip knows what he's talking about. Philip knows what he's after, knows what he's looking for. And Jesus has found him, and he's running to Nathaniel saying, guess what? We found him. But then he identifies him a little further and says he's Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. Now that throws Nathaniel for a loop. You see, Nazareth was an insignificant little town. A town of no good reputation on the southwestern side of the Sea of Galilee, opposite from Bethsaida, so there might have been a little you know, prejudice there anyway. But no big shots ever came from Nazareth. Nothing significant ever happened there. So Nathaniel discounts Philip, despite his reference to the scriptures, discounts Philip based on his knowledge of the town of Nazareth. Nathaniel lets his eyes inform his heart. 
rather than letting his mind inform his heart. Instead of taking what he knows to be true and letting it infiltrate his heart, he looks at the external world and walks by sight rather than by faith. And he rejects the idea that the Messiah could come from a place like Nazareth. You follow what I'm saying? So Jesus had to change his heart. He had to get a hold of him and say, wait a minute, let me tell you something. How does he do it? Well, first of all, he identifies Nathanael's heritage and his character. He says in verse 47, he says, You're an Israelite, indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Now, what does that mean? Israelite, first of all, means he's not a Jew. You say, wait a minute, I thought they were the same. Well, they are today. But then they weren't. Remember, there had been a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom. The northern kingdom was Israel. The southern kingdom was Judah. Initially, a Jew was a person from Judah. The people to the north were Israelites. And so he identifies his heritage, which Jews don't even know their heritage anymore today. I mean, we asked our guide, do you know what tribe you're of? said, nobody knows. <laughs> nobody knows what tribe they're of anymore. Um, so he's an Israelite. So he knows his heritage. But then he says, in whom there is no deceit. Now, at first glance, you would say, well, that makes him an honest man. Jesus knows he's an honest man. I don't think that's all that Jesus means here. I think Jesus is looking and saying, yes, you're an honest man, but there's no deceit in you because you don't allow yourself to be deceived. There are many guys going around claiming to be the Messiah. Nathaniel goes, he's come from the town of Nazareth. That's another pretender. It's got to be another pretender. I'm not letting myself be fooled that easily. I think Jesus is complimenting him here on his discernment. I think he's saying to Nathaniel here, hey, it's okay. You've got good discernment. That's not a bad thing. Listen, if we believe everything someone tells us, we're going to live a terrible life full of disappointment and disaster, aren't we? If we believe everything people tell us, we need to be people who not only refuse to be deceptive, but refuse to be deceived. Which is why we need to know the Word of God. So we're not grabbing a hold of the Joels out of Houston and people like that and following after them because they're not teaching the Word of God. We need to know who we're listening to, know who we're watching, especially in this day and time when people are doing it more from home than they've ever done it. They're watching junk a lot of times. It doesn't honor Christ. Jesus is telling Nathaniel, yeah, you got discernment, man, but let me tell you something. I've got a higher discernment than you. Let me show it to you. Let me show it to you. What does he do? Well, verse 48, Nathaniel says, how do you know me? So Nathaniel knows, he knows him. Jesus says, well, before Philip called you, when you were under the fig tree, I saw you. Now, let's think about that for just a moment. They just arrived. From where? Bethany beyond the Jordan. Just arrived into the region of Galilee. They had to go find Philip. Philip went and found Nathaniel. Jesus had never seen Nathaniel a day in his life. And Nathaniel had never seen Jesus. It's impossible. There was no way. They went on ahead. Philip went on ahead of Jesus to find him and bring him to Jesus. And Jesus says, before Philip called you, before Philip came and got you, I know exactly where you were and what you were doing. You were sleeping under that fig tree. (laughs) Probably taking a, a bite here and there. This proves the higher discernment, higher level perception of Christ. Given the circumstances and the probability of an ordinary man to know what Jesus knew, Nathaniel takes Philip's word for it based on the revelation Jesus now brings to him. Jesus changes his heart from doubt to belief by showing Nathaniel just how well he already knows him before ever meeting him. Nathaniel doesn't know Jesus at all, but Jesus knows him completely. And there's only one way that's possible. And Nathaniel identifies it. Rabbi, you are the Son of God. You are the King of Israel. You're the Messiah. Nathaniel knew it. There's only one way he could know. Only one way. And he knows us too. Just like he knew Nathaniel. He knows us better than we know ourselves. 
He knows words we'll say before we even think them. He knows choices we'll make before we're even in the situation to know what our choices are. That's why when we give ourselves over to seeking Him, He can and will change us. We no longer have to live life in catch-up mode, you know, reacting to everything in life. Because we've got a Savior that knows it's coming before it ever comes our way. Don't let things in life overwhelm you just because you're caught off guard. Run to your Savior who is not caught off guard by the things of your life. He knows the solution. He can bring you through it. He's already got a path laid out for you. Where we hurt ourselves is when things catch us off guard, we panic. And we forget to run to Him. And we start trying to chart our own course and our own way out of it. And it only digs our pit deeper and deeper and deeper when we've got a Savior who already knew it was coming and already has a plan to bring us through. we just got to run to Him and trust Him. We need to be transformed to disciples who are filled with the discernment of Christ. Disciples who are led by the Spirit and have the Spirit's wisdom and knowledge so we can stay ahead of our problems. Listen, believer, you are prepared for that bad news from the doctor. You're prepared for it. You just are. You're prepared for that financial loss. You're prepared for anything that life brings your way because the character, creator, and sustainer of life is in you. He's in you. You're prepared. No matter what comes your way, no matter how bad it is, you're ready because he's ready. The change we have available to us is a change from trying to handle life our way on our own to letting him overcome life for us and through us. That's the life of fellowship. i got one more point. I know I'm running along, but I'm making up for lost time. The third choice of fellowship is to keep your eyes on him. Just keep, once you got them on him, keep them on him. So often Christians fall away from the faith and leave the church because they don't see God doing great things. You ever thought that? I just don't see God doing stuff anymore. I'm not sure about this. And we begin to doubt. Well, I want to tell you, that's not God's fault. We want to live in a form of Christianity that only really looks at Him on Sunday and then wonder why we struggle in life. And that's the typical Christian. It may not be you, but it's the typical Christian today. I just look at Him on Sunday and the rest of the week, it's my time. This is God's time. Now it's my time. And then we wonder why we don't see God do great things. It's not because he's not doing great things. It's because we're unable to see them. Because we took our eyes off of him. God does great things, but not when there are barriers of disbelief and divided lifestyles that we have erected. Nazareth, his hometown. He didn't do many miracles there. Why? Because of their unbelief. God does great things, but we too often just don't recognize Him because we've taken our eyes off of Him. If we're walking by sight, maybe looking at the world around us, then how can we see the great things God is doing? We lack the faith, which is something Jesus looked at His disciples over and over again and says, Oh, you of little faith. When did He do it to Peter? When He started looking at the waves instead of looking at Him. Oh, you of little faith. If you just kept looking at me, you could have kept walking on the water. When we're looking at Jesus, the impossible becomes possible. Amen? Maybe recently maybe you've been through something like this, avoiding an accident on the highway where it just it was a real close one. We had a real close call in Israel. Man, I'll tell you what, our bus driver barely got down on it. Some truck pulled right out in front of him, and I mean, it, was, it, was, it felt like it was that close. And he got down on it, and uh, I was amazed. Our driver was awesome. I mean, he could put that thing in the tiniest of spots, that big bus. We had a 55-passenger bus with 12 of us on it. (laughs) That was our tour. I mean, we all had our own little section, you know, if we wanted to. But suppose you you miss an accident and you've just had brake work done. You you know, that's a wonderful thing. But are you going to thank God that you got that brake work done? Because it was probably the Holy Spirit that prompted you to do it. Do we see life that way or just it's coincidence? Just coincidence I happen to get the brakes done. Not if you're a believer, it's not. God watching over you before you ever got to that potential accident. Jesus tells Nathaniel that his eyes will be open to seeing even greater things as a disciple. He says that, you'll see, he says it in verse uh, verse 50. 
But seeing those things will be dependent upon Jesus being his main focus in life. Look what he says in verse 51. Truly, truly, I say to you, you will see the heavens open and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Jesus, did you notice, is the main focus of these angelic beings that are ascending and descending. They're doing it on the Son of Man. They're doing it on Jesus. But Nathaniel doesn't ever literally see this. This is not something Jesus means literally. Nathaniel never sees the heavens open up and the angels of God ascending and descending on the Son of Man. Not to our knowledge, he he doesn't. I don't think Jesus means this literally. I think he's saying you're going to see great things because Nathaniel would see the blind receive sight. He would see the lame walk, the deaf hear, the demon possessed set free, Lazarus and Jesus himself rise from the dead. That's the power of God at work. And that's what Jesus means by the angels ascending and descending. That's the power of God at work and the glory of God being revealed. And he says, Nathaniel, you're going to see the glory of God revealed over and over and over again. And he did. That he would see the constant connection between Jesus and his Father in heaven. So if we want to see the glory of God in our lives, we got to keep our eyes on Jesus. He said, keep looking at me. You'll see greater things than he. Stay with me. You'll see greater things than me. Why? Because that's where the glory comes from. And if we miss it, it, we'll miss it if we're too enamored with the things of this world. So let me wrap this up. What are you here for? What or whom are you seeking? Seeking to just say, God, you know, give me a check mark on my attendance record for this Sunday. And that's it? I hope not. But many Christians are in churches today doing that very thing. Lord, good fellowship today. I like the fellowship. We all love each other. And that's awesome. And it is awesome. But I hope that's not the only reason you're here today. I hope it's your love for Jesus and your desire to walk out of here more of a disciple than when you walked in. And not just being that disciple on Sunday morning, but being that disciple every single day. Because that's really what a disciple is. You, there's no such thing as a one day a week disciple. That's not fellowship. Challenge you to seek Jesus more, not less. Fellowship means more of Him. I challenge you to become more open to change in your life. Don't accept that what you experience at church or in your life is all there is to your relationship with God. Listen, I have personally, in the last year or two, and this is not me patting myself, but this is a testimony. I have personally grown more in the last couple of years than I've probably grown in a long time, and that wouldn't be possible if I didn't think I still had something to learn. And finally, keep your eyes on him. Learn to see him at work and you'll realize he still does miracles. He still does great things. And you can see his glory as he works in your life and in the lives of those around you. Learn to see his glory and then give him glory and praise for it. The disciples were called into fellowship. I call you to be disciples who follow Jesus by faith, forsaking the world you see around you. Carry him into the world more so you'll carry less of the world into the church. Hmm. Let's pray. Father, I come to you right now and I thank you for your calling of this, your people, to follow you. Lord, sin is us trying to chart our own course, excluding you or barely considering you. Fellowship is you as our main primary focus most all of the time. Oh, we're going to fail, Lord. We admit that we fail. I failed yesterday. Everybody's failed some point in time. We may have already failed before we even got here this morning. But Lord, this series, this, this sermon rather today, you've refocused us gotten us back to looking to you. Lord, may we maintain that throughout this week and not let ourselves be distracted by the winds and the waves of this world. Not let ourselves be distracted by the insignificance of this thing or that thing or or, or how difficult something may seem in our lives. 
May we not let even the troubles, the worst of things that come our way, distract us from you. Because you're our only hope. Lord, when we look to the mountains, where will our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord. No matter how big our mountain might be, you and you alone are able. And so, Lord, may we follow you consistently, day in and day out. We commit ourselves to that now. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.